Uh, our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Elizabeth uh, Varon. Dr. Varon is the Langbourne M. Williams Professor of American History at the University of Virginia. Serves on the Executive Council of BBA's now Civil War Center. She received her PhD from Yale, which we like to think of as the Longwood of New England. Uh, her books include uh, Southern Lady, Yankee Spy, The True Story of Elizabeth Van Loo, a book which won a number of, of awards. Published many other books as well. Uh, she's the author of Disunion, The Coming of the American Civil War. Uh, also Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War. And her most recent book is Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War. And that's the topic she, that you talk about today. Thank you. It's so delightful to be here. Thank you all so much for coming out. Volume good? Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. all right. In his first wartime message to Congress, delivered on July 4, 1861, nearly three months after the Confederate fort firing on Fort Sumter, President Abraham Lincoln cast secession as the work of a small band of conspirators who had cowed the South into submission. After drugging the public mind of their section for more than 30 years, as Lincoln put it, the leaders of the secession movement had relied on ingenious sophistry and on coercion to bring many good men to a willingness to take up arms against the government, Lincoln said. He speculated, as he put it, quote, there is much reason to believe that the Union men are the majority in many, if not in every one, of the so-called seceded state. If we fast forward two years uh, and uh, set a new scene, Everett, Edward Everett, the renowned Northern orator, speaking at Gettysburg at the famous dedication of the cemetery there, at which Lincoln gave his Gettysburg address, November 1863, we see Everett do Lincoln one better. Everett proclaimed at Gettysburg in 1863, quote, I do not believe there has been a day since the election of President Lincoln when, if an ordinance of secession could have been fairly submitted after a free discussion to the mass of people in any single southern state, that a majority of ballots would have been given in its favor. The hour was coming, Everett promised, when the power of the leaders of the rebellion to delude and inflame must cease. Now, to modern ears, this kind of political rhetoric, what I'll call the deluded masses theory of secession, sounds strange, strangely naive, or perhaps cynical. Lincoln's message, as I quoted it to you, delivered in the early days of the war, can perhaps be explained as wishful thinking. He hoped that a show of force would diffuse the secession crisis, bring Southerners to their senses. But surely Edward Everett knew in 1863 Standing at Gettysburg, dedicating this ceremony, surrounded by the graves of thousands of dead men, that the Southern masses were diehard Confederates, not the unwilling dupes of slaveholding aristocrats. Could Lincoln and Everett have really believed what they said in these speeches that I quoted to you? I'll argue this afternoon that the answer to that question is yes. Lincoln and Everett were giving voice in the, these speeches to a powerful and resilient belief among Northerners that they were fighting a war of deliverance, waged not to subjugate the South, but instead to save the Southern masses from their own leaders and to deliver to Southern whites and blacks alike the blessings of free society. I am to show today, thinking about political rhetoric, that deliverance was such a powerful theme that it drew followers like a magnet to the Union cause and enabled Abraham Lincoln to forge a broad coalition for winning the Civil War. I'll focus in my comments this afternoon on three themes, Union soldiers' motivations, the rank and file, second theme, the process of emancipation, and the third theme, Lincoln's contentious re-election bid in 1864. And along the way, I'll try to explain why Northerners' belief that they could save the South persisted even in the face of massive evidence that Confederates did not want to be saved. Is volume okay? I'm getting a little feedback up here, but I'm clear to all y'all. All right, good. So first let me provide a little bit of pre-war context. Lincoln faced the challenge from the start of uniting a divided Northern home front. 
At one end of the political spectrum in the North were conservative Democrats who were vehemently opposed to social change, hostile to the anti-slavery movement, hostile to the idea of racial equality. On the other end of the Northern political spectrum were the era's progressives, the radical Republicans, who championed the abolition of slavery and black civil rights. In the vast middle of the political spectrum, where most voters and most Union soldiers resided, were those who considered themselves moderates, opposed to extremes. They were uneasy about slavery and they were uneasy about abolition. They regarded both slavery and abolition as uh, dangerous and divisive. As you all know, in this very informed crowd, Lincoln was elected in 1860 on a Republican Party platform that tried to play to the middle of that political spectrum. Republicans called for restricting slavery's expansion to the West, but not for any kind of federally mandated abolition in the South. And the Republicans' hope was that once slavery was bottled up and contained, could no longer spread, Southerners would see fit to someday gradually dismantle the institution voluntarily on their own. That was the Republican moderate vision of the future. Deliverance rhetoric had its roots in a northern critique of the South that Republicans such as Lincoln had popularized in the pre-war period. <clears throat> According to that critique, the institution of slavery had rendered the South undemocratic and unproductive. Only one in four white Southern families owned slaves, but very clearly slaveholders dominated Southern politics. And they did so, Republicans argued, by depriving the Southern masses, the non-slaveholding masses, of free speech, of education, of economic opportunity, and of social and technological progress. During the secession crisis, those crucial years in the wake of John Brown's raid, this critique of the South resonated not only with anti-slavery voters in the North, but also with Northern Democrats, with Northern conservatives who felt betrayed by the Southern wing of their own Democratic Party. And this critique primed Northerners to believe that cunning secessionist conspirators, elite slaveholders, had seduced and duped and terrorized the Southern masses into leaving the Union. As the New York Times put it in June of 1861, quote, the people of the South are regarded as our brethren, deluded, <clears throat> deceived, betrayed, plundered of their freedom of inquiry, of speech, and of action, forced into treason by bold, bad men. The secessionists, bold, bad men. If the spell of secession can only be broken and Southerners induced to cast off their false idols, Northerners reckon the latent unionism, patriotism of the Southern masses would reassert itself. So let's talk some about Union soldiers and their worldview. Union soldiers marched off to war with this kind of deliverance language, these deliverance appeals literally ringing in their ears. As a local dignitary told a Massachusetts regiment at a flag presentation ceremony in the spring of 1861, quote, there are millions of the white race in the South who daily pray to God for the sight of your advancing columns as their only hope of salvation from a bondage worse than death. Those Southern masses are there waiting to be liberated by you, Union soldiers. And these kind of public pronouncements are, are one thing, but uh, private letters tell a very similar story. Over the course of the war, Union soldiers would profess and repeat like a mantra, as though they'd been handed a script from which to read uh, and, and, and write. They would repeat this pledge to save the South. Take, for example, the correspondence of Private Charles W. Sherman of the 12th Connecticut Volunteers. He wrote some 160 letters home to his family over the course of nearly three years while he was deployed in Louisiana and in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. And again and again in letters to his wife and family, he described the war as a struggle to break the hold slave-holding oligarchs had over the white Southern masses. In the spring of 1862, as New Orleans fell the Union forces, Sherman observed of the South's common whites, quote, they do not think for themselves, but let their political leader lead them by the nose wherever they please. Sherman looked forward to the time when this deluded people, as he referred to Southerners, would, quote, be brought back to the faith and love of its youth. Now, I emphasize in my book, as I think about these soldiers' letters, 
and diaries, that this kind of language filled emotional needs for these Union soldiers like Charles Sherman. Across this broad political spectrum in the North that I've just described for you, soldiers shared, had in common, a fealty to what historians have called the affective theory of union, as in affection. And this was the idea, very prevalent at the time, that the union was designed by the founders to be consensual, not coercive, bound together not by force, but by the mutual affection of its citizens. The Union Army citizen soldiers believed that bonds of affection among the citizens were what made the Union exceptional in the world, a shining beacon of representative government unlike any other government on the globe. Thus, to achieve victory, Union soldiers like Charles Sherman reckoned they had to do more than vanquish the Confederates on the battlefield. They had to teach the Southern rebels to love the Union again, to restore those bonds of affection. Deliverance rhetoric, with its emphasis on the guilt of the slaveholding elite and the punishment of the slaveholding elite, and on the redemption of the masses, help Northerners retain this hope in restoring a union held together by heartstrings. The guilty would be punished, but everyone else would be welcome back. For Northern soldiers, interestingly, the deliverance of the South meant reclaiming the Southern landscape as well as population. As they marched through the Confederacy, Union soldiers, as you, as you uh, know and can imagine, commented extensively on the Southern terrain. But they didn't see the South simply as enemy country, forbidding and hostile. Instead, Union soldiers saw Southern soil as part of their own national history, their own patrimony. They saw the South as a land of faded glory and unmet potential that slavery had degraded and that a free labor system could regenerate. As Charles H. Brewster of the 10th Massachusetts wrote in April of 1862 from Eastern Virginia, quote, this country is a wonder to all Yankees. There is no reason why this should not be as thickly settled and thriving as any country on the face of the globe. The soil is good, the climate too, and everything grows here that we could wish, and it would be a magnificent region, but for the curse of slavery which has blighted it. Men like Brewster believed that as the Federal Army moved through the South, it would bring progress and prosperity in its wake. This kind of deliverance rhetoric, this worldview, also served for Union soldiers as a counterweight to feelings of bitterness and vengeance, and there were plenty such feelings. Naturally, Northerners yearned to establish the justness of their war, and imagining themselves as liberators of the South, not conquerors of it, helped them defend, rationalize the escalating brutality of the war. The use of tactics such as confiscation of property, sieges, bombardment, which targeted the Southern home front and infrastructure, and at the time civilians. Interestingly, none other than a much more famous Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, the premier symbol of Union hard war policies, imagined himself as a liberator of Southern rights. In Sherman's own mind, he aimed to prove to the Confederate people that their own leaders could not protect them, and thus expose as lies the false political doctrine, as he put it, on which secession rested. And so Sherman, as he instructed his soldiers on how to comport themselves on their famous march through Georgia, told them that they should, quote, discriminate between the rich who are usually hostile, and the poor and industrious, usually neutral or friendly. That is to say, reserve their wrath for the elite, the ones to blame for secession. As the Union Army exacted its toll on the rebel leadership, the Southern masses would, Sherman predicted, and I quote him, discover the error of their ways and repent of their hasty action and bless those who have maintained a constitutional government strong enough to protect its citizens the way the Confederacy could protect its own. So all of this begs the question, and it's a doozy of a question. I'm sure it's occurring to you. How much suppressed and latent unionism was there among whites in the Confederacy? How did common whites in the Confederacy feel about secession? Well, we historians have the benefit of hindsight. And it's quite clear in hindsight that Lincoln and other Northerners were wrong about a Southern population deceived and coerced into supporting the secession movement. To be sure, there were pockets of unionism 
in the mountain south, uh, where there were fewer slaves and slaveholders, but in plantation districts of the south, by contrast, white southern unionists, those who remained loyal to the union, were few and far between. Confederate military authorities aggressively fostered a culture of fear to stamp out dissent. Suspected unionists were subject to arrest and imprisonment, confiscation, and the depredations of guerrilla bands. And Confederate loyalists, uh, uh, rather unionists, willing to sustain such abuse were few and far between while Confederates eager to mete it out were numerous. The robust Southern nationalism of whites in the Confederate states, in other words, reflected some underlying demographic realities that Northern ideology had failed to fully account for. It's true that only one in four white Southern families owned slaves, but if we add up the number of whites who worked for slave owners, rented or hired slaves, was, were related to slaveholders, hoped one day to own slaves, it becomes clear that the broad swath of Southern whites were invested in slavery and believed it to be a necessary system of profit making and racial control. The resilience of Confederate nationalism and the relative absence of, uh, of uh, unionism among whites in the Confederate states also reflects the power of Southern propaganda. And I'll turn now to that subject to say a few words about it. The premise of the Confederate war was that Northerners and Southerners could never again be countrymen. <coughs> Confederates were thus determined to discredit and silence Yankee appeals to the Southern masses. They were well aware of this deliverance rhetoric and eager to neutralize it. Thus, from the start of the war to its finish, and indeed even before the first shots were fired, Confederate propaganda insisted that the North waged ruthless, remorseless war and sought the brutal conquest, not the liberation of the South. You see a battle of ideologies and propaganda. As the Richmond Daily Dispatch put it in May of 1861, early days in a typical formulation, quote, blood, thunder, fire, smoke, rapine, and entire subjugation are now the favorite terms of the Northmen who were bent upon violence and extermination. Lincoln was mustering a mercenary army, the dispatch continued, of cutthroats, outlaws, and vagabonds motivated by greed and bloodlust. This was the Confederate image of the Yankee army, and needless to say, it was a far cry from the federal troops' image of themselves as liberators. Over the course of the war, the rising tide of death and destruction only intensified the fervor of diehard Confederates, predisposed from the very start to believe that the hated Yankees would not fight fair. Confederates cir circulated endless tales of the invaders' depredations against civilians and of their uh, pollution and violation and degradation of the South. These were the sort of words, extermination, violation, pollution, degradation, that were the key words of Southern propaganda. As the Union took aim at slavery, Confederates reviled the Emancipation Proclamation as the culminating proof that any reunion between the North and South was utterly impossible. Now, of course, none of this boded well for white Southern Unionism. And indeed, as I've explained, Unionists never materialized in the seceded states in the numbers that Northerners hoped for. But my key point is this. Union soldiers remained committed to Southern deliverance because that commitment was ideological. Soldiers fit the facts to conform to their belief system, a belief system that emphasized man's capacity to reform and repent. Northerners went to war, in other words, hoping to change Southern hearts and minds, and that hope proved very, very resilient. I'll address one more crucial facet of the battlefield before turning to the politics of the home front. Of course, the composition of the Union Army changed dramatically midway through the war, as African American men were finally permitted to join the ranks of the Union Army. They'd been turned away initially, but finally permitted to join uh, at the moment of emancipation. And the more than 200,000 African-American men who served in the Federal Army and Navy represented an infusion of fighting power and of courage and morale that proved critical to the Union's ultimate victory. Black soldiers, too, like white Union soldiers, wrote and spoke of the war as a war of liberation. They cursed the slave power conspiracy. They heralded the potential of free labor to remake the South. But it's very important to note 
that black soldiers defined deliverance more broadly than white ones did. They understood themselves to be fighting a battle on two fronts, against the horrors of Southern slavery and racism, and also against persistent racial discrimination in the North, where they were free but relegated to a second-class citizenship. So for African Americans, deliverance connoted more than freedom from bondage. It connoted full citizenship, full inclusion in American society. So I'll turn now to the crucial role of deliverance rhetoric in the story of emancipation. Now, as I have suggested, Lincoln faced the challenge as president of managing a divided northern home front. His critics to his right in the Democratic Party sternly warned him not to take any radical steps against slavery. His critics to his left in his own party urged him to move more quickly toward abolition. So how did Lincoln's emancipation policy take shape? Well, as many of you surely know, the conventional explanation is that Lincoln uh, initially avoided any drastic action against slavery for fear of, fear of alienating conservatives and moderates and gradually came to embrace emancipation only when he saw that events on the ground, most notably the mass exodus of slaves from southern plantations toward the Union Army, when he saw that these developments were eroding the institution, the war was undermining slavery. Lincoln then justified emancipation for a skeptical northern electorate, primarily on expedient grounds as a military necessity, a way of punishing the Confederacy by depriving it of resources, slave labor. In other words, the prevailing narrative, the prevailing image of Lincoln emphasizes his pragmatism. He's making an expedient choice to deprive the South of resources. I would like to emphasize, by contrast, elements of Lincoln's idealism. The pragmatism is there, but so is a, is a kind of idealism. Lincoln and his allies will develop the case over the course of the war that black freedom would have broad benefits for all Americans, including and especially for the South's common rights. <laughs> Slavery, Lincoln realized, reasoned, was the root source of Southern despotism, of that uh, a power that planter class had. Slavery was the primary obstacle to national reunion. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve, Lincoln famously intoned in his December 1862 annual message to Congress, arguing that black freedom would enhance the quality of white freedom. Lincoln was echoed by many of the North's most influential public figures, to give an example, Harry Beecher Stowe, a familiar name, celebrated author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, wrote that the Emancipation Proclamation promised not only the liberation of slaves, but of white Southerners too. As she put it, the Emancipation Proclamation would deliver our misguided brethren from the wages of sin. And as she went on, the descendants of the very Confederates who reviled Union soldiers during the war would, because of emancipation, someday grow up in liberty and justice, as she put it. Now, crucially, and you all, again, a very uh, informed crowd would be interested in the, in the sort of uh, inside baseball here of the politics. Crucially, Lincoln and his party enlisted slave state whites in making this case that emancipation would enhance uh, the quality of freedom. Four slave states, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, and Delaware, had resisted the siren song of secession. And as you all know, it was a major strategic priority for Lincoln to keep those states in the Union. And so men from those slaveholding border states who were willing to uh, embrace and endorse emancipation, men like Kentucky Republicans Robert J. Breckinridge and Cassius Clay, became valuable allies for Lincoln because they could argue to other Kentuckians that they should, uh, they should um, stick with Lincoln. Equally important to Lincoln was a small, tiny vanguard of white Southerners from Confederate states, prominent uh, Southerners who were willing to stand by the Union and defend Lincoln's policies. The most influential of these was, of course, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, but there are other figures less well known now, Andrew Jackson Hamilton of Texas, Edward Gant of Arkansas, men who were willing to uh, defend the Emancipation Proclamation and cast it as a sort of blessing in disguise to the white South, a seeming punishment that in time would do momentous good. For example, Hamilton, the Texan, in a January 1864 pamphlet addressed to his fellow Texans, promised, as he put it, that their sins would be pardoned if, like the prodigal son, they repent and ask to be forgiven. 
Emancipation would deliver whites from their present bondage and set Texas forth on a new career of prosperity predicated upon truth, industry, and intelligence, as Hamilton put it. Now, as Hamilton's reference to the prodigal son asking for forgiveness suggests, loyal Americans turn to metaphors to conjure how the Union would save the South. In uh, Union rhetoric, Confederates were pupils who needed teaching, patients who needed curing, children who needed parenting, heathens who needed converting, drunkards who should sober up, madmen who needed to come to their senses, errant brethren who should return to the path of righteousness, prodigal sons who should return home. In a medical era in which pain was seen as a sign of healing, you weren't healing if you weren't in pain, oftentimes these metaphors invoke the redemptive nature of suffering. Suffering would do you good. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell of the Women's Loyal National League, a patriotic group in the North, made up of prominent uh, female activists, used a medical analogy, common analogy, in which the South was a wounded limb. She said, quote, we have no idea of lopping off the offending member. Let us bear with it and heal its infirmities, even if we are forced to apply the severest remedies and to suffer cruelly ourselves from the sympathetic agony. Pain itself will be redemptive. Again, trying to get in the mindset of 19th century people, images of religious purification abounded in this rhetoric. Describing the Union War as a holy war, a very prominent Unitarian minister and head of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, Henry Bellows, intoned from his New York City pulpit, quote, we smite to heal and resist to bless and kill to make alive. Now, African-American abolitionists who had long been in the vanguard of the anti-slavery movement made their own distinct contributions to this deliverance rhetoric. Their focus, as I've suggested, was on how black freedom and citizenship could redeem not only the South, but all of America, not only from slavery, but also from the sin and burden of racism. Religious themes are very prominent here, too. The Old Testament story of Israel's exodus from Egyptian bondage was central to anti-slavery politics, had long been, as were other biblical texts, such as the story of the year of Jubilee from the book of Leviticus and the biblical proverb, Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands to God, which was an abolitionist slogan. And naturally, providential images of God's will abounded in African-American commentary on the Emancipation Proclamation. The year of Jubilee has come. A January 1st, 1863 editorial in the black newspaper, The Pacific Appeal, proclaimed the deep lamentations of the slaves how long, how long, O oh Lord, before our deliverance shall come to pass, had been answered. Highlighting the crucial role of slave resistance and black military service in undermining the Confederacy, African American leaders argue that the only sure way to reclaim the South for the Union was to grant full citizenship and voting rights to the truest of the South's Unionists, namely slaves and former slaves. Of the 200,000 African-American men who served in the Union Army, we should note and not forget, nearly 80% were Southerners. Nearly 80% of those African-American men in the Union Army were Southerners, former slaves. In the words of Frederick Douglass, quote, the more men you make free, the more freedom is strengthened. And the more men you give an interest in the welfare of the state, the greater is the security of the state. In other words, give men the vote, give them a stake in society. This was, in Douglass's view, the true path to permanent peace and prosperity. The activist and poet Francis Watkins, uh, uh, Ellen Watkins Harper agreed, declaring the lesson of the war to be this, quote, simple justice is the right of every race. There were, in short, varying degrees of anti-slavery sentiment in the Union. But together, and this is something worth emphasizing, together those who championed emancipation did something quite radical in the broad context of American history. By claiming black freedom would enhance white freedom, they rejected a very, very old zero-sum game theory of race relations that had prevailed since the colonial period. They rejected age-old pro-slavery arguments that black freedom could only come at the expense of white freedom, that any gains for blacks would be losses for whites. They made an idealistic defense of emancipation. This, and this was a bold argument. The potential of that argument to mobilize and unite loyalists, however, was given a very stern test 
in Lincoln's re-election battle of 1864, and I'll turn to that as my last theme now. So again, as this uh, informed audience will know, Lincoln's re-election was not a foregone conclusion. And to understand how Lincoln prevailed in 1864, we have to recognize that his election campaign was a referendum not only on emancipation, but on Lincoln's other signature policy, a policy that we uh, collectively have understood much less well and emphasized uh, too little, and that is Lincoln's program of amnesty, his program of amnesty to Confederates. It was announced in December of 1863, and it offered forgiveness and a restoration of political rights to any white Southerner who took a loyalty oath, an oath of future loyalty, accepting abolition and pledging future allegiance to the Union. All would be forgiven, rights uh, uh, restored, uh, uh, should uh, the, the oath taker accept abolition <coughs> and uh, the laws of the land and pledge uh, allegiance. This amnesty plan also offered readmission to seceded states that could form an electoral core of these oath-taking loyalists, equal to 10% of a given state's 1860 electorate. The amnesty program is called the 10% plan as a consequence for sure. And Lincoln imagined that states like Louisiana and Tennessee and Arkansas, where there was a strong union occupation force and a vanguard of some homegrown unionists, would lead the way and model for other Confederate states how to re-enter the national fold restored to the Union. Now, I said signature policy. It is impossible to overstate how enthusiastic Abraham Lincoln was about this amnesty plan. He really hoped that it would appeal to wavering Confederates, again, change hearts and minds. He thought it might encourage mass desertion from the rebel army. He ordered Union scouts to take the amnesty plan to enemy lines. And cavalry expeditions were sent out, supplied with the copies of it were left behind in southern dwellings. This was really uh, a, a, a strong set of appeals. For Lincoln, at the uh, emancipation of African Americans and amnesty for whites were two sides of the same coin. And his linkage of these two policies was integral to the presidential contest of 1864 and to the way he prevailed. Hoping to attract a wide range of voters in 1864, Lincoln and his allies dropped the divisive party label Republican Party. They knew some Democrats would never be able to vote for a Republican. And they chose a new moniker, the National Union Party is what they called themselves to, to associate themselves with uh, patriotism and not with partisanship. This was the best way, Lincoln and his allies reckoned, to neutralize the threat from his rival in this presidential contest, George McClellan, Union general and Democratic uh, standard bearer. The Democrats, again, as you all surely know, had adopted a controversial platform in this election campaign, calling the war effort a failure, calling for an armistice in the negotiated peace, and as you also surely know, the most strident of Lincoln's critics in the Democratic Party in the North, the so-called Copperheads, were virulently racist and seemed willing not only to dispense with emancipation, but to sacrifice the Union and possibly even to concede independence to the Confederates. They were that critical of Lincoln. They condemned emancipation. They warned that it would result in free people swarming northern cities and displacing white workers. And these Copperheads, interestingly, echoed Confederates in portraying Lincoln as a remorseless tyrant who was waging war without mercy. But Lincoln would not permit himself to be painted as a conqueror. Here we see the political importance of deliverance rhetoric. The National Union Party's campaign was built around the theme of Southern deliverance. Hence, Lincoln chose as his running mate the most celebrated of all white Southern loyalists, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee. Lincoln's moderate and conservative supporters in the North held up amnesty with its theme of forgiveness as his crowning achievement, as his central policy. As the Franklin Repository of Pennsylvania put it, emphasizing amnesty, the president still aimed at the great end, quote, the disenthrallment of a great people, by which this Pennsylvania paper meant white Southerners. The purpose of the war was to disenthrall the white Southern masses from the rule of elite slaveholders. Lincoln's backers trumpeted in the election campaign what they considered to be deliverance success stories. The statehood of West Virginia, which had been delivered from Confederate rule and its commitment, the commitment of that state to gradual emancipation. The rising influence of the Republican Party in places where it hadn't been strong before in Missouri and Maryland. 
uh, Republicans charting the course towards abolition in those states. The Union's success at retaking, I mean, rather, at recruiting in, recruiting soldiers in Kentucky and Louisiana, which uh, furnished many men to the Union Army, and most famously, the liberation of the beleaguered Unionists of East Tennessee. All of these were held up by Union's uh, uh, Lincoln supporters as examples of how deliverance was working. William Seward, for example, in a fall 1864 speech in Auburn, New York, during campaign season, not only promised that the Union would greet liberated Southerners as, quote, brethren who have come back from their wanderings, unquote, he also claimed that, quote, the Union men and all the slave states that we have delivered are even more anxious than we are to abolish slavery. Witness West Virginia, Maryland, Missouri, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Arkansas, he said. Now, Seward was blatantly glossing over the persistent factionalism and anti-abolitionism in those states. It was, a, a, again, a somewhat wishful view. But it wasn't entirely fanciful. Lincoln, in this 1864 election, would win electoral votes in Missouri and Maryland and West Virginia, and all uh, would go on to abolish slavery. In other words, the National Union Party expanded Lincoln's coalition by perfecting a sort of big tent approach. Lincoln's mainstream backers could emphasize this theme of amnesty and white Southern deliverance, while radical Republicans and abolitionists could focus on black freedom and citizenship as themes. And to give you a sense of where they stood, I will observe that Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, criticized Lincoln's amnesty policy for failing to establish black voting rights as a condition for the readmission uh, of Southern states to the Union. But Douglas, despite this criticism, nonetheless endorsed Lincoln in 1864, because he knew that although Lincoln's Republican Party wasn't perfect, the Democratic Party represented something far worse. A McClellan victory would, as Douglas put it, restore slavery to all its ancient power and make this government just what it was before the rebellion, simply an instrument of the slave power, meaning of elite slaveholders. So abolitionists like Douglas will support Lincoln because the choice was a choice between moving forward and jumping backward, as they put it. So in the end, I'll begin to wrap up here. In the end, Lincoln won a resounding victory in 1864, notching 212 electoral college votes to McClellan's 21. At this critical juncture in the war, Lincoln had not only maintained his coalition, he'd extended it, winning a greater mandate than he had back in 1860. Calling this victory at the ballot box the great deliverance, Reverend Cornelius Edgar of Easton, Pennsylvania, marveled at how Lincoln's conduct of the war had, quote, magnetized, blended, harmonized, and unified the discordant elements of Northern public opinion. The fall of the last rebel stronghold to the Federal Army in the spring of 1865, in a sense, brought deliverance full circle. After the Union Army entered Richmond, Secretary of War Edmund Stanton gave an impromptu address to a rejoicing throng at the War Department in Washington, D.C., and Stanton declared at that moment, in this great hour of triumph, my heart, as well as yours, is penetrated with gratitude to Almighty God for his deliverance of the nation. He will teach us how to be just in the hour of victory. But Confederate sur surrender would reveal to the Northern public the depths of Southern defiance. Grant's lenient surrender terms at Appomattox were intended to ease reunion, again, by changing hearts and minds, by affecting submission and repentance. But as Lincoln felt to an assassin's bullet, loyal Americans began to grasp that no such repentance was forthcoming. The slave power conspiracy, as they called it, of elite slaveholder secessionists was crushed, but the Southern masses had no intention of repudiating their leaders or renouncing their lost cause. The Union won the war, but its victory was incomplete. Although Union uh, deliverance rhetoric had helped to promote solidarity among Unionists, it had ultimately failed to convince Confederates to accept peace or black freedom on the Union's terms. And here's a pattern we often see in the wake of wars, we see in this case. Once the shared goal of defeating the slave power conspiracy was accomplished, that complex in the Union coalition lost its common purpose. And disagreements over the meaning of victory, what would victory mean? The meaning of freedom came to the fore within the Union coalition after the work of winning the war was over. And of course, the most striking and revealing example of this is the conduct of Lincoln's successor, one Andrew Johnson. During the war, Johnson had fancied himself a liberator, and he'd gone so far as to describe himself as a quote-unquote Moses to enslaved blacks. 
After the war, his own deep racism came to the fore. Johnson defined black freedom very narrowly as the right to work for wages, but uh, not the right to full citizenship rights. And Johnson cynically revived the zero-sum game racial thinking that I alluded to, the idea that any gains for blacks would come at the expense of whites. He very much trumpeted that sort of toxic view. Indeed, Johnson used the presidency to push a reactionary argument. He argued that the Southern masses who had been the victims of the slave-holding oligarchs before the war were rendered the victims during Reconstruction of radical Republicans, extremists on the other end of the spectrum, and their uh, egalitarian agenda of black suffrage and civil rights. And Johnson literally pledged to fight radical Republicans just as he had fought secessionists. The black reformer Lewis Hayden, lamenting these developments, wrote, quote, deliver us from such a Moses. I fear he will prove to be the pharaoh of our day. As former Confederates regained power and drove blacks out of Southern politics, the long-lived hope that the white Southern masses could be delivered ran aground on the shoals of racism and recalcitrance. I'll close by observing that 19th century Americans had their own distinct political vocabulary. And it consisted of words, words like union and disunion, which would fade from use that we don't really use anymore, or change in meaning in the modern era. And in a sense, deliverance is such a word, very much a 19th century word. As American politics became less steeped in biblical references, the word became less prevalent as a political signifier. But it retained its power as a signifier in the long freedom struggle. As the scholar John Coffey has observed, quote, the collapse of Reconstruction ensured that the biblical story of Exodus retained its resonance. Living under Jim Crow and segregation, black Protestants found they had neither reached the promised land nor got clear of Egypt. Over the course of the long civil rights crusade, generations of African American activists, together with some white allies, have again and again drawn on the symbolic power of deliverance narratives. And Americans opposed to change in a grammar with its own long history have revived the rhetoric of white victimhood whenever the system of racial privilege is challenged. Thank you.